Well, tonight, I'm going to do a, something a little bit unusual for me, so、um, don't be shocked. This whole evening has just been kind of random, so <laughs> just kind of apropos for the evening. But anyway,、um, I'm going to focus tonight on priorities. Tying into Pastor's message this morning when he spoke about our death appointment and are we ready when our death appointment comes? Because none of us are exempt from it. And the truth is that we get to choose. It's our choice what our destiny is, whether it's heaven or hell. Our choice. What we choose to do and how we prioritize really makes the difference between victory and defeat. And this is, this is true in our school, in our job, in our relationships, and definitely in our spiritual life and destiny. So, prioritizing is a tool that allows us to attain or achieve our goals. As I was preparing for tonight's message, the Lord was challenging me. Uh, to prioritize my faith journey、um, as I was praying for a closer walk with Him. He's always challenging me to do something new, even when it's something He's done before. And what I mean by that is what He's challenged me with five years ago, that same challenge presented to me today looks different and plays out different. So in our journey, we always strive to be growing. And so how I grew last month. And the challenges that I overcame last month, that same challenge will look different. So, when the Lord says to me, Kathy, just prioritize to get closer with me, how I did it last month looks different than how I do it this month. While I was in the middle of preparation for this message, I,、um, I was working on it Thursday, and I have a、um, teen accountability group. And my group and I are just jumping back into the regular routine after a super busy summer. Um, I see one of my girls. We did miss you. <laughs> She had other commitments.、Um, but we were talking about with the new year、um, the different challenges that are presented in light of those changes. The girls were sharing、um, they have new teachers, they have new classmates, new schedules, new responsibilities. And so all of those things are just very, very challenging. And we were discussing how not having a groove or a rhythm just can really stress you out. And confound your goals and your peace. So, we were talking about it, and I realized that the new activities and goals that they were setting、um, really required that prior- prioritization was key to their success.、Um, but that's not only true for them, it's just true for, for us in our spiritual journey. So, the last time that I talked about a month or so ago,、um, I invited you to do an assessment on listening to God and receiving His messages, which He sends to us daily in countless ways and in countless methods. And it's just, I was just asking us to just look and see if we're really primed to receive God's messages of love, which surround us all the time. And so tonight, I'm going to invite you to take an inventory on the priorities in your life because they really do influence your personal relationship with your Savior and how you experience life, whether you walk in victory or you walk in defeat. And that's true for, for all of us. So I think many, many of you, and probably most of you, know, that, know the Ten Commandments and understand that the first two commandments are instructions. On priorities. From the creator of everything, the one who wants us to thrive and receive, thank you, Pastor Joe. He wants us to thrive and receive all the goodness that he has for us, and he wants that for all of his creation. And he gives us instruction in how to prioritize our life. Um, which is a huge help to us if we receive the information and follow his instructions. He knows how we can walk in victory, and he tells us. And he starts right from the beginning.、Um, in the garden, he immediately gives Adam instruction. And that's just how God is. He's not hiding anything from us, he spells it out for us. 
When Jesus began his ministry and taught from the mountainside not far from Capernaum, he offered people a way of life that would allow them to live under grace and experience blessings from living a holy life, not through human perfection or legalism, which is impossible, but through faith and obedience to Christ. This sermon that I refer to is famously known as the Sermon on the Mount, and it's found in Matthew chapters 5 through 7. We're not going to cover all of those chapters this evening, but I did want to pull out one of the scriptures um, that just kind of sums everything up for us. Uh, Jesus says in Matthew 6, 33, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. God is often helping us to prioritize so we can experience life the right way through the power of his redemptive work at the cross and through the power of his indwelling spirit. So I'm so thankful for the Holy Spirit um, who speaks to me when I'm going in the wrong direction or I'm praying and I'm like, Lord, I have so many things on my to-do list. My schedule is full. What is it that you would have me do? And he is so faithful. And sometimes I I have to recognize and submit to his authority and his goodness. And he will say, nope, just, just push all that, those things on your schedule away. I have something different for you today. And I'm so thankful for the leading of the Holy Spirit because he is good and he's never wrong. Even life coaches of our generation know the value and significance of prioritizing. The late Stephen Covey is a well-known and highly respected author, professor, and speaker on this very subject. Two of his best-known works are First Things First and Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And both of these books are required reading in many undergraduate and graduate studies. And I know that some high schools require this as some of, from some of their top students, especially students in leadership. Prioritization is um, not even a topic that's debated. I think it's just acknowledged that it's necessary for success to have a plan and to chart those actions or those steps to achieve those goals, those objectives. So the question for us tonight and really every day and until we're called home is what are the priorities in our lives? I heard somebody say once that if you want to see your priorities, look at your checkbook or in current translation, your debit transactions. What are you spending your money on? And I I think that's definitely true. I also think that you could say the same of your planners, our planners. Those are good indicators of priorities. What are you spending your time on? What are you giving attention to and and spending your resources on? It's not just financial um, resources. We have other resources. And so we really need to understand what our resources are. We need to identify them. Um, Some resources include time, money, our talent, our spiritual gifts, our thoughts. Those are resources. And God's love. We're given a certain amount of days from the day we're born. In the United States of America, the life expectancy average is about 80 years, give or take a few years. Um, It's actually 76 years for men and 81 years for women, according to Statista, which is an organization that provides statistics for research and analysis purposes. Um, We don't know the exact number of our days, but we do know that some people have much less, much fewer than the average, and some people have many more days than that. Um, I don't know how often you think about that. Um, Where do I fall in? Am I going to be the average? Am I going to be above average? Am I going to be below average? And it really doesn't matter what we think because we really don't know. Only God knows the answer to that. But what we do have the answer to is what are we doing with the days that we have? Let's say we get a full year. We have 365 days in one year. We have those resources that I identified. And how are we choosing to use 
and expend those resources. We exchange a day of our life for something every day. So just, just imagine that if we were is, issued a mysterious number of coins at birth, and every day we get to choose what we can exchange that coin for, we don't know how many coins we're going to be issued. Um, maybe, maybe children probably can identify this when they go to, now if you go to like Chuck E. Cheese, they give you like a credit card. It's like a it's filled, you just fill it with coins. And so moms and dads will say, oh, you can just play until all your, your money is gone. And the kids have no idea. So they can go going, oh, I'm going to be able to play all day. And then they play one game and they go, mom, I'm all out of, my card is all up. And mom goes, oh, sweetie, isn't that wonderful? You got to play one game. Okay, let's go. <laughs> you know, they don't know, but that's kind of where we're at. We really don't know. Um, but we do get to exchange our, our day for, for one coin. Um, so we can, we can do that at church. We can choose to exchange that for a day at work or um, school. We can do that. We can say, I'm going to spend time with my family today, or I'm going to go spend time leisurely, or I'm going to exchange it for some alone time with God. You know, there are lots of different ways that we can, we can spend that, that money on the coin. But the coin is non-refundable. So immediately you know that there are no refunds and no exchanges. So once you buy your day or your time, it's done. Um, so you can't go back. <laughs> Prioritizing efficiently means that we spend our coins on important things. And in light, of it, in light of eternity, it's really important that we not waste them. Our destiny is before every one of us, and we don't know when we're going to arrive there. I'd like to illustrate how valuable today is. And in this basket, there are some papers with numbers. And these numbers, there's all kinds of numbers in here, they represent how many coins you get to exchange. Which, um, so basically, this will be a surprise, just like life is a surprise to us. So I'm going to ask you, though, to just stop for a minute and think about it. How many days do I have left? And for you math people, which I am not a math people, I got through my degrees because I'm married to a math whiz, and he tutored me, bless his heart, a lot so that I could pass my, my algebra classes. So math is not my uh, forte, not my gift at all. But um, so for those of you who are math whizzes, you may be able to say, oh, you know, I think I might have, you know, 10 years, or I might have 40 years, or I might have 60 years. You can just go in your head and, and calculate how many days that would be. So think about that. And challenge yourself to think, if I only had three days, would I be really selective with what I do in those three days? If I have 365 days, which is a year, would I be more selective with what I'm doing? What if we have to give an account to God for the choices that we make with the days that he gives us? Romans 14, 12 says that, he, that we will all give an account to God. So we really don't have to wonder about that. Um, the question is, is Jesus representing you on that day, on the day that you stand before God to give an account, or are you going to try to stand on your own merit? I'm grateful for Jesus' grace, which covers me, and his Holy Spirit, who has guided me ever since I confessed him as Lord and Savior. I can tell you that because I could never stand on my own merit. So did any of you really think about how many days you have left? Pastor made a reference to Pastor Don Bird this morning, who is a highly respected and loved pastor on our district, who just passed away last Sunday. So a week ago this morning, um, very unexpectedly. And I've been praying for his family in church. It was a total shock. No one expected that to happen. Um, and if you could remember his family and friends and his church and this district, 
there's a lot of people that have been impacted. Um, it's been a it's a great loss for us and the people that are left behind, but it is definitely heaven's gain and his too. Um, he's with his Lord and Savior and experiencing the the reward that he looked forward to receiving. And he has no more concerns or stresses or weaknesses to contend with. Life is, is really great for him. Um, I just want to share a little bit about what I know about his, um, his weekends. Um, on some Saturdays, he served with Heaven Train, and he shared the gospel and love of Christ with children and coworkers in the Kansas City area. Um, I don't know if he served all day, but my husband, Bob, will sometimes drive for Heaven Train, and when he does, he leaves our house at 7.30 in the morning, and he doesn't return until 4 or 5 in the afternoon. Um, it's an all-day affair, and Bob has shared with me that it's a powerful and blessed ministry similar to our J Train. We do something very similar. It's a powerful, powerful ministry, and um, children are hearing the gospel, and, and adults are hearing the gospel, and God is at work through J Train and Heaven Train. Um, Pastor Don would then preach a message after serving at, at Heaven Train. He would go and serve his congregation and preach a message on Sunday morning and, and just shepherd and love on his people. And last Sunday was no different. He preached, he served Holy Communion, he pronounced a benediction, and then he collapsed. He was gone immediately. It sounds like Pastor Don exchanged his coins for days that were filled with purpose priority and he chose some of the best things to exchange his coins for he made great investments in just days prior to his passing and I suspect that it's pretty demonstrative of his daily choices I didn't know him personally I only met him a few times um, in passing but those who know him speak of a loving spirit a kind character and a very generous man I've heard that he invested in the lives of others by mentoring them, sharing the gospel, and serving lots of people. Last Sunday, he gave his account, and I can't help but think God was pleased with his choices last weekend and every other day that he chose the best, not just the good things in life, but the best things. He chose the eternal things rather than the temporal. He chose God rather than himself. So tonight, here's the difference, a uh, little wonky thing that I'm doing tonight. I'd love for one person to come up. Raise your hand if you would be willing to come up and pull a number. Somebody, who's the brave one? I see hands going. Oh, Miss Danae is coming up. Thank you, Miss Danae. She's courageous. If you call the office, you know this is a courageous woman right here. <laughs> okay, what number did you get, Danae? 55. So tell me, how does that align with the days you thought up? Like, oh. Mm -hmm. So was it shorter than what you were hoping for? Okay. <laughs> all right. <laughs> all right. So, so let's say we all, that she's representing all of us. So we all pulled out 55 days out of the basket. Now, we don't usually get to know how many days we have. Um, but let's just say that um, we did. We knew it was 55. Uh, how would that affect the priorities in your life? With this amount of time, are there some things that you would eliminate from your life? If so, what are those things that you would eliminate? Are there some things that you would make room for in your life? Like, oh, I only got 55 days. Boy, I thought I was going to be able to work on that next year sometime. I'm going to make room for that in my life. What are some of those things that you need to make room for? If there were things that you really identified as needing to be eliminated and things that you need to make room for, then I just want to encourage you to do that right now. Start today. There's no greater time than to start than right now. Prioritizing your life doesn't necessarily mean choosing between good and bad. It usually means choosing between good 
and best. Why settle for good when you can have the best? Sometimes I think we have to ask ourselves: Are we counting on days that we're not guaranteed to have? The book of Haggai is a, a potent message about how God sent a prophet to tell His people to prioritize. Now, these were people who left their lives and their homes in Babylon to reclaim the Promised Land, and that was not an easy endeavor. And they were aware of it. They eventually—it's it's an amazing story—they um, eventually became discouraged and they gave up on rebuilding the temple. God sent Haggai to remind them that their victory would come through the hand of God. That God would bless them for their obedience. Haggai brought attention to the fact that they had lost their focus and were looking to their own interests. The rebuilding of the temple would be a blessing for many generations. It was bigger than they could see. Their efforts of the day would have a payoff that they couldn't possibly fully understand. Haggai pointed out that they were focused on their own interests instead of God. And before we jump all over them for losing focus, I think we need to recognize that we all do that. We may not lose our focus for an extended period of time, but we do lose our focus. I suspect that there isn't one person here who constantly has his or her focus on God and matters of the kingdom. However, I suspect there are lots of people here who spend a lot of their focus on God and kingdom matters. We're all guilty of wasting our resources, exchanging those coins for something that really isn't or shouldn't be a priority. And once in a while, it's manageable. But when that once in a while becomes a lifestyle, victory is no longer ours. The things of this world begin to overcome us, and the peace of the Lord becomes an experience in our history, and is no longer a reality. And I am reminded of that when I start talking about. I, I think it's very important that we share about things that God has done in our past. But I also want to make sure that I'm sharing about the miracles that God is doing currently in my life, in my walk with Him, because He never stops doing miracles. So those testimonies just keep on coming. Haggai. Wasn't coming down on the Israelites because they weren't because they were worshiping idols or they were disobeying God out of a rebellious spirit. That's not what it was at all. They just got caught up in the routine of life. They were farming and building and raising and supporting families. None of these things are bad. In fact, all of those things are good things. I thought it was interesting that then when I was working on this message and I was in、uh, the book of Haggai, I recognized that the first of four messages that he delivered was actually on August 29th, 520 BC, exactly 2,539 years ago, as of this past Wednesday, <laughs> which is when the Lord led me in that book. And I thought, "Huh, that's interesting, Lord. What are you doing there?" But the message that he delivered on that date, all of those years ago, can be summed up as God will grant true blessings when we put His house first. This message itself goes against our flesh, because it's natural for us to put our house first. We're taking care of the things we have, but the eternal blessings come. From putting God first, and they transcend anything that we could think of in our own house. The things that we think on here are temporal, and they can be lost in the blink of an eye. One dire circumstance or situation can take all of those blessings away. 
but that is not so on eternal things. That's not how God's house works. As, as we do our self-evaluations, I think that it's important that we keep some things in mind. One, that often the people who put their own interests above God's are committed believers. Second, the people who put their own interest above God's have reasons, good reasons, for their lifestyles. Um, some examples are, I've got to work. The Bible says that the man who won't work won't eat. The Bible says that a man who does not feed his own family, he's worse than an unbeliever and has denied his faith. Maybe you've heard our kids require most of our attention. They just need us. Just we have to be there for them on Sunday. Or Sunday is my day to catch up on sleep and household chores. So I think you've all heard of those reasons. I've even used some of those. Have you ever employed any of those reasons? You know, I mean, they're very common. The people who put their own interests first are blind to God's rebuking, correction, or guidance. The people who put their own interest first never get what they're after. The next thing we need to keep in mind is we must continually prioritize God's house above our own. And these are the new challenges. That's why the challenges that, God's, that God presents to me this week are different than how they played out last month, even though it might be the same challenge. Then we also need to remember that the people who put God's interest above their own are constantly self-evaluating because they fear God. And I'm not talking about they're afraid of God, but they fear him. They know that he is almighty, all-powerful, and all-knowing, and they don't want to disappoint him. They don't want to miss out on the blessings of God by you know, going off in the wrong direction. And then we need to recognize that the people who put God's interest above their own have clear goals. This is what I want my spiritual walk to look like next month. This is what I want it to look like next year. This is what, you know, so those goals are spelled out. They're identified. The people who put God's interest above their own please and glorify God. They do the work of God and are truly blessed by God. So as we perform our self-evaluation, we need to be asking ourselves, what are our goals? And do they align with God's goals for our lives? Are we seeking God's kingdom above all things? Is there something in my life that I'm unwilling to surrender? And there's no judgment in that. It's just being open and transparent before God and allowing him to reveal those things to us which hinder us from receiving all that God wants to give us. And we need to be praying about it as we're evaluating. We can't do it in our own power. We need to ask the Holy Spirit to do a work in us. Because it's him alone. He alone knows what's best for us. And when we make his kingdom a priority in our life, we really are choosing the best over what is good. There's a retired pastor in Flagstaff, Arizona, by the name of Stephen Cole, and he suggests that we ask the following questions whenever we're prioritizing or trying to set some goals. And then we need to defend it. We need to defend the answers that we come up with scripturally. One question is, should every Christian put God first? Or is that just for full-time Christian workers? The second one is, how can a Christian succeed in a career if he puts God's house first? Does God want Christians to excel in their career? The third question to ask is, is it okay for a Christian to have and enjoy nice things. Where do we draw the line? Is luxury a sin? 
And four, how should Christians view their retirement years? Is retirement a biblical notion? So those are just some questions to consider as we try to prioritize our, our goals. Do not think that opting out of spending time with or focusing on God in the kingdom will produce victory. That's deceit, and it doesn't come from God. No matter how many material items a person gains, it does not indicate success and the things that matter most, the best things in life. And I remember as a child hearing... Um, you know, you need the best things in life. And then those will be the commercials. This sports car or this type of, you know, necklace or these types of clothes. And so it was very hard for me to understand and filter that out because constantly we're being just inundated with those kinds of deceptions. And so it's really important for us to be able to filter that out and, and do it very conscious, consciously. We need to be aware of that. Because the best things in life come from God and he yearns to give them to us. All we have to do is follow his lead. If we make him sovereign over our lives, he will bless our commitment to him, not just for today, but for eternity and for our descendants. Let's close in prayer, shall we? Dear Lord, making you a priority isn't always easy. It isn't even easy when we're committed to doing it. So we just ask, Holy Spirit, that you would help us. Help us to choose the best for each day that we are presented with, Lord. Not for us. Let us not choose the best things for us, but choose the best things for you and for others. Help us to be on high alert about what we are exchanging our coin for, Lord, and give us courage to stay the path. We know, God, that you are a good, loving God and that you should be our top priority, Lord. We love you. Here we are surrendering and seeking you first above all things. In your precious name, Jesus, we pray these things. Amen. Let's stand for the benediction. May the days of our lives be expended wisely, living each moment in a way that will please our God. Go in peace.